Wonderful, wonderful, everybody. Happy Friday to everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm flattered to be here and to be presenting this topic. It's a, an exciting topic for me in the world of disinfection because it fits within the world of pesticides, actually. Uh, of course, it's tough times with uh, the virus and all the fatalities and, and harm we're seeing. So we'll, uh, we'll take it quite seriously. Uh, I'm going to go over a variety of uh, topics, but ultimately the goal here is to talk about cleaners and disinfectants, uh, various hotspots, uh, and of course, uh, personal protective equipment. Now, the, each of these can be a very long presentation, so I'll skim through some of these. And of course, I'm always amenable to contacting uh, me for uh, further questions online or, or through Facebook or any other uh, social media. Okay, so let's begin by some definitions because there is confusion even in the titles of these, of these three words of what exactly is sanitizing. And that's the word we use for cleaning, uh, essentially removing grit, material, oils off, uh, off products or materials. And that, san so when you wash your hand, you're sort of sanitizing. As opposed to disinfection, which literally is a is sort of an EPA and FDA regulated phrase that specifically deals with inactivating pathogens. Pathogens are disease causing organisms. Uh, so when you disinfect, it means you're killing those bugs. Uh, sterilization is killing all the bugs, all the bacteria, all the viruses, all the mold spores. And of course, hospi hospitals are well uh, versed in uh, sterilizing, whether it's through steam or chemical methods. So primarily today, we'll be dealing with the first two. Uh, I also, before we start, I want you to keep this concept in the back of your heads that it's a function of concentration and time. And what I mean by that is that the higher concentration of the chemical or really even of the heat, the shorter time you need to do your kill. And this is a delicate balance. And, and there are many analogies to this, right? When we cook, you could put the, the, the heat on full blast and cook a steak on a grill in five minutes, or you could put it on a low heat and cook it for 30 minutes. Uh, both processes cook the meat, however, and use the same amount of, uh, of uh, time, uh, same amount of energy, but of course you have different outcomes. So keep this idea of concentration and time, whether it's washing your hands or putting a disinfectant on a surface. So let me quickly go over the, some of the chemistry of this, uh, just uh, uh, quickly to say that there's only a handful of categorical uh, in, uh, disinfectants, pesticides out there. And aldehydes are commonly used uh, this is some names of products, and you could look for these in your labels when you're investigating, is this a disinfectant? Alcohol is very common. Uh, it's, it's in your home in the form of uh, strong alcoholic beverages, as well as in various uh, other medications. Uh, halogens, chlorine, if you, you probably remember chlorinating a pool or chlorinating a surface, these are very powerful chemicals. Uh, many of these are also very caustic and can cause problems. So chlorine is, is a tough one. It's a very good chemical. However, it does cause various issues. Uh, ozone is similar to, uh, to uh, chlorine. And by the way, halogens in ozone and peroxides have the unfortunate uh, benefit of not keeping, not producing a residual amount of protection. So um, hydrogen peroxide does the kill very quickly and dissipates. There's nothing left over. Whereas some of these other materials, especially phenolic compounds and especially the quaternary ammonia compounds that are very prevalent today, these are a little better because they last longer. So it's a delicate dance here between, uh, between these uh, chemical uh, disinfectants as far as efficiency and safety and use. And of course, you all heard about ultraviolet C uh, uh, being used. This is very common, even, even in acne treatments years back. I remember I was dosed with UVC to treat my teenage acne. Um, so ultraviolet light does kill bacteria, viruses, and of course, it has its risks also. So that's it. Those are the categories. And they're regulated by different groups depending on where this material goes to. 
Uh, let's start with FDA. When you look at these products, uh, there is some common feature through all of them, and it's the word antibacterial, uh, antiseptic, kills bacteria. Uh, all these are registered, reserved words that uh, mean something and cannot just be put on a label. They have to be approved for use. So when you see these products, you can rest assured that there is some disinfectant chemical in the uh, formulation, and including um, Listerine, which is, of course, a, uh, a mouthwash. The key here is that all this material goes on your skin. It's intended to go on your skin. And the important uh, point there is that it, um, uh, it's different from the surface disinfectants that will go over in a second. But it's more than just these reserved words you have to look for. It's also uh, making sure um, uh, you're not conned into other type of products. All these products are soaps. They do inactivate coronavirus, absolutely, I'll explain that in a second. However, they don't have a disinfectant in them. Even the middle one, it's very clever how this vendor puts the word wash away bacteria with a little asterisk. It doesn't say this product washes away bacteria. They can't say that. Uh, and notice how bacteria is in very small letters, but they do have a little asterisk, which on the flip side explains that this is not a disinfectant uh, labeling of this product. So it's uh, very interesting how they get uh, around some of this. So going back to the products with the antimicrobial labels, uh, the key thing there is active ingredients. And if it has a disinfectant, it must be labeled, not just the percent and the name, but also the purpose. So these three products, whether it's an antacid on the left, uh, tells you exactly what the active ingredient is and, and the percentage and what's it for. The middle one is a, um, a soap dial, has a triclosan. This is triclocarbon. Uh, however, this is an antibacterial ingredient in that soap. And the one on the right is head and shoulders, which has medicine in it. So all the FDA products that go in your mouth, on your skin, on your hair, uh, any part of your body must be FDA approved for this usage. Uh, don't forget that. Now, of course, you know, our favorite Purell, if you read the label, it's very proud. It says kills most germs. It's a number one brand. And you see it has an active ingredient of just ethanol, pure, uh, well, 70% ethanol. And keep in mind, you may want to peruse the inactive ingredients, which is all the other stuff, the gels, the aloe, the uh, fragrances, and the colorants, and everything else that makes that part, uh, that uh, material, that product whole. So it's fun, sort of fun reading these labels. But keep in mind, if it goes on your skin, and it's supposed to kill the coronavirus or, uh, or any type of uh, microbe, it must be part of that active ingredient, it must be so listed. Now, let me just go back to soap. Uh, we should use soap. Uh, there's no reason not to. Uh, soap has a polar and a non-polar component, meaning part of it is water soluble, part of it is fat soluble. And what that means is the membrane around the coronavirus, that blue a membrane you see on the right is a, a lipid membrane. It's a fat membrane. And when soap actually uh, bonds to that, carries it out and breaks it apart. So the good thing there is that this virus is sensitive to lipids. And of course, soap uh, can carry that away. Uh, of course, keep in mind, soap also removes, soap is also a sanitizing agent, meaning it removes dirt. And this is an important part. Too many people, uh, I, I've seen too many people using uh, hand sanitizer, alcohol hand sanitizer as a cleaning agent. Uh, your hands could be full of mud and you could use alcohol uh, sanitizer on it. And when you look at your hands again, they will be full of mud. There may not be any bacteria or virus in it, but it, it, it does not clean your hands. Hand sanitizer, it disinfects the hands, does not remove the dirt. If you want to remove the dirt, you need a soap. 
Um, now, the next product, which is sort of more important or equally important, especially for some of the uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, homes, uh, the uh, home health aides are using this. Uh, my mother is, uh, has a home health aide coming every day. We have procedures on what she should do and where, what products she should use for, for different areas. But it is a complicated world. So these surface disinfectants are for hard surfaces, kitchen surfaces, floors, uh, even clothing, and not your skin. It's very important that when you read this, you'll see it's a disinfectant, and it's got an EPA regist re registration uh, number associated with it, and the establishment, meaning who, what company is it, and what is the, um, the registered uh, ID for that product. Uh, if it is truly a surface disinfectant, and when you go shopping, you should look for this, flip the label and look for that EPA registration and establishment number. If it's not there, it's not a disinfectant and you can't be guaranteed. So all, the, <clears throat> all of these products you see in front of you are disinfectant surface cleaners regulated by EPA for efficiency, whether it's Clorox, or uh, Lysol or any of the other products. Most of these are either ammonia or chlorine based. Some of them are phenolic, like Lysol is more phenolic based. Uh, and, uh, and the one on the bottom left is, is where I'll, I'll focus in a few minutes is what we're using today in tremendously high quantities in uh, urban centers and homes and residential and hospitals, the works. By the way, when a product is is EPA, uh, when a product has an EPA registered ingredient, they are very proud of it and they will let you know. Notice right there on the Lysol kills 99%. Same thing with the Clorox bleach. You don't hide this information. You're very proud of it. So a vendor more than ever will tell you. Meaning if it's not on the label, something is amiss. So what we have here is our uh, governor uh, of New York, Governor, uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo is demonstrating the use of a fogging device. Uh, so what we have here is lemon quat. The, immediately, quat refers to quaternary ammonia. Uh, and you see that this is a US EPA approved commercial strength surface disinfectant for fogging. There are three key words there. This is not your average material that you can buy. It's a stronger formulation. It's made for surface disinfection, not airborne disinfection, and it's, uh, it can be fogged, meaning it can be released as an aerosol. Uh, and that's what he's doing. Notice on the, uh, on the right, we have this fog generating machine that picks up some of the material and sprays it as a very fine aerosol, much the way we're releasing coronavirus when we cough. And of course, the fogging is evenly dispersed on, on the tables there, on the uh, chairs of the subway. Also, keep in mind that he's wearing his respirator, his N95 respirator, the wrong way. These straps should go around the crown of your head. So it's a little embarrassing for him to be shown here. But things like that do happen. The material is easily researched online. You can get the safety data uh, sheet for this. Uh, you could go through uh, either the EPA website and look up this number. And you see it has very low percentages of these active ingredients. And the first one in the, um, well, notice it's, it has two ammonia compounds and a phenolic compound. So it's really a blend of two, cat two categories of disinfectants, the phenolics as well as the ammonia compounds. So now what you don't want to do here is mix this compound, which has ammonia, nitrogen, with chlorine. That's always a no-no uh, where we see too many accidents this way, and I'll, I'll talk more about that uh, later on. So uh, you see that this is a balance, a very delicate dance between how good is this stuff, how long does it last, you know, the kill, how quickly will it kill and how, what's the residual time? Are we going to damage the plastic, the clothes, the counter, the marble, uh, the materials that we use, stainless steel? And of course, is it producing excess risk to the user? Of course, most of these uh, users, notice the operator 
uh, himself on the right is fully covered, protected, gloves, suits, face masks, the works. So uh, uh, that is usually the case when you're using commercial strength materials. And again, uh, feel free to peruse the uh, EPA website. Uh, the link is um, in the presentation later on. And you could uh, literally type that number from the back of a label and learn more about it. My concern very often is people are taking a liquid and putting it into a spray bottle and using it as a spray aerosolized material. Uh, if it's not meant to be sprayed, it will not be sold in a sprayer. So do not put weakened chlorine uh, bleach in a uh, atomizer a uh, spray bottle and use it on surfaces. That material is meant to be poured, sponged, and wiped on a surface. So uh, the misuse of that is quite common where people buy a liquid, put it into a sprayer, and then spray it. If that was permissible, uh, it would show up on the EPA usage as well as on the label. Usually it says it right there, do not spray this product. Okay, and if you go to this website, you could search all sorts of products. Uh, here's just a list of a couple of the active ingredients, just like I told you, either chlorine or ammonia or phenol. Uh, it does a very good kill. Fortunately, this virus is not that hardy, so it's nothing special with regard to kill. Uh, so if it's killing rhinovirus, it's likely also killing a coronavirus. And of course, the contact time which is very important. You can't just spray material and then walk away. You wanna make sure that, um, that there's enough time for it to do the kill. All right, and I can't say it enough, what you buy in the home repair stores is not the same as what you buy in the commercial uh, stores that are, sent, uh, that are producing very high quantities and high concentrations of this material. So if, you are in a uh, congregate living uh, home and you are ordering material, your chances are you're using the commercial strength, the industrial strength, and that must be used carefully according to the, to the instructions, as opposed to what I may be getting from my mother's house, which is a residential formula from a local market. Uh, those are, are, well, it's just like prescription drugs versus over-the-counter. One is much stronger and therefore much more risky than the uh, over-the-counter formulation. So please be careful with that if you're using commercial strength products. Um, sadly, uh, yes, COVID-19 home poisoning is increasing. And this is a case here in uh, France where uh, chlorine has, has again been shown to be causing some problems in the application of uh, of disinfection practices, uh, not just in France, but we're also seeing in the US. And this is a recent report um, that came out in MMWR. And when you look at the poison control, uh, poison, poisoning, the reporting of poisons, uh, poisonings in the US, you, you, they have this very nice graph in the report that shows uh, from, for the same period, the uh, last two years, 2020 is shown a market increase in exposures and poisonings related to cleaners. And you can see that red, that line, that black line going straight up right when the epidemic hit. And when you look at uh, disinfectants, the same thing is happening. Um, and again, it's probably that we're using cleaners a little bit more than disinfecting agents, but both of these. So this is not good news that we have a public health crisis and we're adding to the crisis by using uh, strong chemicals improperly. So please, this is the purpose of this uh, webinar is to sort of get you some information on how to digest this, uh, this field and, and proceed to choose products carefully and protect yourself uh, and of course, uh, all the clients. So what do we know so far about uh, survivability? Well, we, we do know a lot. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, but we know, for example, in air, the virus uh, dies off uh, rather quickly after three to six hours. Uh, of course, what is air? Dry air, cold air, hot air, moist air. So we'll elaborate in a second. We know that on paper, uh, when they spray a viral load on paper, it within uh, one or two days, the virus 
is desiccated and is no longer active. Uh, we know that on metal, the virus lives a little longer, uh, probably because it's not desiccating as much. And this is not good news because a lot of our surfaces in our homes are metal or plastic. So whether it's a countertop or a doorknob, uh, this is a little unfortunate that in air it may die off quickly, but on metals and plastic, it's usually in the days. Uh, now there are a lot of variables here and this report <clears throat> by um, uh, the, the uh, National Institute for um, Infectious Diseases, uh, Fauci's group, uh, was one of the first, but it seems to be substantiated. This is actually helping us and will help you sort of make some decisions on, on where to go. Uh, keep in mind that what we know is that high humidity uh, adversely affects the virus. The virus does not like high humidity. The virus is inactivated. Also, higher temperatures are, um, are better for killing the virus than low temperatures. So in some ways, winter is the worst because it's dry air and cold air and the virus survives as opposed to very hot, humid climates where there seems to be more rapid die off. Of course, this refers to the airborne aerosol and not necessarily the other materials. So. So let's quickly go over uh, transmission. Um, and um, and but transmission both ways, whether you're symptomatic, asymptomatic, infectious, uh, back and forth. <clears throat> Here is a, a graphic that I prepared for you that hopefully you'll understand. And by the way, you just noticed I coughed to clear my throat, excuse me. And what did I do? I immediately put my hand to my mouth. That is so, instinctual. Everybody seems to do it. No one just coughs. They're always covering their mouth. And of course, these are my hands and I'm going to touch things. So, uh, but I'm not infectious. So this uh, person is coughing. They are releasing droplets. Uh, these are large particles, moist. The virus is in those particles. As they move through the air, the, uh, the moisture dries up. The particle actually gets smaller but the viruses are still in there. Uh, and of course, what ultimately is possible is having free floating viral particles. Uh, now that's a big question mark there. How, how much does this happen? How far do those free floating viral particles go? Uh, are they out there floating on the streets, in the buildings, in the, in the uh, maintenance areas of, uh, of buildings? Where are they? So this is a, a bit of an unknown for us. Uh, we also have uh, various generating possibilities. For example, uh, breathing, you're not releasing droplets or aerosols or particles, just breathing normally. Talking, unlikely. I'm probably releasing because of the, you know, my, uh, my presentation and all the consonants, which tend to release more droplets than, uh, than other uh, sounds. So when you're lecturing and people are projecting, chances are they are releasing aerosols. Obviously coughing and sneezing, absolutely you're doing this. And the key is, where is this stuff landing? And, uh, and for us, for this group that I'm talking to, which I know is both you know, an occupational group and, and a residential group, managing all sorts of homes, making all sorts of decisions, where does this stuff land? The red particles, where are they landing? And uh, if they're landing right there on the counter, well, you have to clean that counter. So, uh, and also this may be an asymptomatic person. So um, uh, I, I coughed a few seconds ago, a few minutes ago, and uh, maybe I am now uh, asymptomatic and I'm releasing viruses. And meanwhile, it's on my keyboard. Uh, hopefully not. But I think you get the point that these particles will come out and land. And, and I think a lot of our, uh, a lot of this epidemic was transmitted through this type of, of uh, transmission um, because ultimately you're going to touch that material, put it to your face or, or mouth, and of course, infect yourself, as opposed to simply breathing contaminated air. But the science is still uh, out there, so we'll learn more about that. Uh, and where does this stuff land on? It lands on fomites. Fomites are the stuff around the house, phones, clickers, puppies, uh, all sorts of things that collect 
what is coming out from our uh, mouth. Uh, now, in a, in a kitchen, there's so many fomites. I mean, look around here. This is a beautiful kitchen. So let me get rid of this beautiful kitchen and go to my kitchen. Ah, that's better. And, and here you see on the left, the uh, handles for the refrigerator, the handles for the cabinets, my kitchen counter, my uh, cappuccino maker, uh, everything out here. If someone is infected and coughing and uh, releasing aerosols, this entire area theoretically is, is got contaminated materials, which then when touched and put to your mouth can continue the epidemic. So this is the key, right? This is why we're doing the seminar. And what are some of the, uh, the practices out there? Well, I wanna go through these, uh, these and then we'll leave time for questions. So I wanna make sure we, we try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, so let me proceed through each one of these. And I realize some of you may or may not have uh, some of these devices, but let's uh, try to stay general. First off, dishwashers. Dishwashers, unbeknownst to most people, uh, are sanitizing devices. Cold water doesn't enter a dishwasher. It's always hot water. So it always comes in at 120, 125 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a pretty good point of killing. But most dishwashers have sanitizing cycles and most people are not using them. And this, by the way, commercial dishwashers in restaurants and hospitals and healthcare facilities uh, probably automatically default to the sanitizing cycle. So be careful here, you know, uh, but most home dishwashers are, uh, are uh, just use the hot water from the tap. And by clicking this button, you're guaranteed to get 150, 155 degree Fahrenheit water, which will kill just about everything. Um, it won't sterilize your dishes, but it will definitely disinfect and kill all the pathogens. So one advice is to start clicking on that button. 99% of home dishwashers have a sanitizing cycle, and usually it's a National uh, Sanitation Foundation approved uh, device. That's what that NSF stands for up there. The number two is your washer and your dryer. Your washing machine has a sanitary cycle. Now this is a little trickier, meaning it gets to 150 degrees Fahrenheit because you don't wanna ruin your clothes. So it's a delicate balance here between um, damaging your clothes and protecting your health. But for certain things like your uh, homemade uh, face masks, this is the cycle you need to use not just soap, but also the sanitizing cycle. Um, and almost all modern washing machines, including, including um, uh, laundromats, will have a setting for this. Uh, some, it's not required, but I, I've seen it in laundromats. So even if you don't have your own washing machine, it's possible that the one in the laundromat has that cycle. So try to use that where you can. Dryers are, are different. Many, some dryers, not all, will have an extra hot cycle. Now the fear there is you're gonna shrink your clothes and ruin things, and that's a real risk. So be careful with that, it's very risky. But also it's not a very hot cycle because hot dry air can cause problems and, and maybe even fire hazards. So you generally don't see this, uh, this button on many dryers, but some of them do have an extra hot cycle which can help, uh, help uh, disinfect your clothes. But if you're washing in the sanitizing cycle, you don't need a sanitizing drying cycle. I think it's probably redundant. Okay, uh, what about groceries? What do you do with groceries? What do you do with food? What do you do with utensils? Very complicated world out there, but the good thing is just last week, FDA came out with an advisory that pretty much said it's not necessary. Uh, they do not uh, recommend you automatically clean, wipe down, disinfect all your groceries. Uh, however, in typical government fashion, if, uh, if you feel you want to, by all means, go ahead. Now the key, the warning here, I'm a little concerned because what do you use? Do you use an FDA hand sanitizer? Uh, to disinfect or do you use a Lysol surface disinfectant? And keep in mind that the FDA is protecting 
the human body. Ultimately, they want to make sure that the ingredients in hand sanitizer, when ingested or permeating the skin, will not harm you. And given that food is something that's going to go into your body, I think if, if you're trying to sanitize the outside skin of an apple, which you may eat, you don't want to be using Lysol because that was not meant for, for that ingestion. So be a little smart here on what to use. Uh, and sometimes soap and water may be the easiest. But some advice, you'll see more and more fruits and vegetables in packaged plastic coverings. This is anti-environmental, it's anti-green, we're going the wrong way, but we'll get back to the right way soon enough, hopefully. Um, but I'm seeing more and more of this, that people don't wanna just buy tomatoes, they want them pre-wrapped, because th there's some assurance here that you are not buying something that someone just coughed on. And even when I'm shopping, I find the, the bad practice of picking up some apples, I don't like this when I put it back and I get that one. Uh, and I try to stop myself, but it's a, it's a difficult uh, thing because I'm used to picking and selecting my tomatoes versus just you know grabbing um, the first one I see and not putting it back because once I touch it, I have to buy it. Then you have box items. Some people are removing the the food, the the cereal from the box, figuring if someone coughed on the box, it has viruses. I don't want to touch it and put myself at risk. I'll just throw out the box and take the inside. So there's a couple of things. And, and many people are washing canned goods or plastic goods. And FDA is, is, uh, is not saying you, you shouldn't. They're saying you don't have to. But again, it depends on your risk, where you're working, who you're protecting, uh, your age, and all the other variables that come into it. So some of these are, are individualized decisions for the, the, the occupational setting you're in. Uh, and obviously, if you're caring for elderly with multiple health conditions, it, everything gets bumped up to a higher level of, of standard there. Okay, so let's go over coronavirus uh, in soil. No, there is no coronavirus in soil. Uh, the only possible uh, exception is it possible that we, we have people coughing on soil and then minutes later someone is using that soil? It's, pr it's somewhat preposterous. So do not worry about uh, soil and gardening. Go out, have fun uh, with all of that. Uh, likewise, what do you do with shoes? I just told you there is no coronavirus. It cannot live in soil. It needs a, it needs a living cell to replicate. It wasn't uh, the reservoir of this virus is in an animal species, right, bats. So, um, uh, so there's no risk. But we, in environmental health, really promote the idea of removing shoes which are contaminated at the doorstep. And then, of course, keeping the home house, the whole house dust free and protected. So uh, a host of environmental chemicals can be found in shoes, including uh, 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 urban dust, which may have mold and spores and uh, mi dust mites, et cetera. So removing dust from a house is always a good, healthy practice. And the best way to do that is to keep your shoes off and in many ways, bare floors. Uh, so these three are not ways to protect yourself against coronavirus, but just to keep a healthier home. Uh, and most of the, um, the problems we see in a lot of homes tend to be dust accumulation, because you never think of dust as a health hazard. Okay, uh, uh, moving towards the end of uh, the presentation, let me talk a little about respirators and face mask usage and cleaning. We see all sorts of respirators out there. Most of them are paper or synthetic uh, paper uh, composition. Some are cloth. I think you know plenty uh, about N95. Seems like the whole world now knows what N95 stands for. However, the proper N95 is an approved mask with all sorts of labels on it. So if you don't see a lot of writing on a mask, it's almost immediately suspect. Um, and here are some uh, guidelines on that. Uh, the next option that CDC just uh, uh, approved for uh, healthcare workers 
Um, and is much more prevalent are the KN95s. KN95s are the Chinese uh, uh, approved respirators, obviously coming from China. There are some good features here. Right away, you'll see that it has ear straps, that ear uh, hooks that go behind your ear. So if something goes around your ears, it cannot be an N95. It's probably a KN95. Um, they're not bad. I sort of like them. Uh, they fit a little looser and sometimes a little harder to get a, a nice tight fit around the nose, but they definitely are, are very valuable in controlling this epidemic. Um, then we have, of course, surgical masks. Some are disposable, some are a bit longer than that. Uh, we see plenty of those. Plenty of you have been, gotten into making your own masks, all different styles. Some are very professional, like the one on the left. Others are sort of bandana, uh, handkerchief type. The good thing here is that disinfecting these, as well as the bandanas, is very easy, right? Just take it off, put it in the hot wash, and uh, reuse it. Uh, so that, therefore, most people should have several of these. Okay, and of course, make sure they're color, color coded to your, your clothing. Uh, it's very important to look good also. Uh, now, as far as disinfecting, we're back in my kitchen here. As far as disinfecting, I have a, a couple of uh, recommendations, all coming from CDC. So I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, steaming, 150 degrees for about 20 minutes. Think of steaming vegetables. Basically, you're, you're setting up a steaming operation and keeping it there for you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. You could also put the respirator in a plastic bag with a little cup of water, put it on high heat, uh, put it on high in your microwave and nuke it for 30, 90 seconds. Um, and it does a really good job. In some ways, I like that better. Interestingly enough, the metal in my respirator is not sparking when I do that method. I can't quite figure out the physics of that, but I'll have to investigate it. The alternative is dry heat, putting it in an oven uh, for, uh, for basically uh, 30 minutes at 160. 140 is sort of the key kill point, uh, but let's just go to 160, 200 degrees for 30 minutes. So that's another possibility. Um, there is a YouTube on this if you'd like to click with instructions on how to do it. It's a short YouTube. I'll let you go there in your spare time. And keep in mind, everything I just said is on the CDC web page, and it actually says there, microwave steam bags, uh, a 1100 watt uh, uh, microwave unit, 90 seconds, 99.9% .9 kill. So all of this is sort of great guidance by CDC. Now, going back to air and paper. You remember when I said the virus doesn't live much longer than three to six hours in air, one to two days in paper. What has been proposed and is being done by a fair number of people is rotating respirators. So let's say you have five respirators, N95s, the best ones, and you uh, are using them daily. What you want to do is use one, a different one every other day, and after five days, go back to the first one. You want to store this respirator in a paper bag so it can breathe a little, not a plastic bag. You want that moisture to come off and the air circulate, and if possible, even put it in the sun. But there, many, many people are using this, figuring if the virus lives only one or two days on paper, then uh, keeping it there for four or five days will give us that extra protection. So if you're concerned about that. Now, there are many messages here, and um, and. Let me, let me start, I wanted to do this uh, sequentially, so I forgot my animation. The first one, hand sanitizer. I'm such a big believer in this. Use it all the time. Uh, it seems to be more prevalent these days. You have these hand sanitizing uh, dishwasher, uh, these uh, sanitizing dishwasher cycles and, and washing machine cycles. Now is the time to start using them. Uh, always make sure you're buying EPA registered surface disinfectants and using them properly. And be careful with the do-it-yourself form formulas. Uh, they're, I'd say not now. This is not the time to sort of save money and make your own lemon cleaner using a synthetic, organically, environmentally safe compound. I'm sorry. At this point, I want a EPA or FDA certified ingredient that does the job.
Um, I am very suspicious of gloves. I, I'm worried that too many people are using gloves, usually the wrong way. Uh, I don't know why they're using it. Do they think they're protecting themselves versus, versus the client, the patient, the, uh, the elderly? It's, it's a complicated world, and I think people need to think through this a little bit better. So what's the point of, of wearing gloves if you're t touching contaminated fomites all day long, um, et cetera? Uh, interestingly enough, also respirators have the problem where people are always adjusting them. And when you're adjusting them, you're touching your face. And that's also risky. So people told me, wear a respirator because um, uh, you'll, um, you'll protect yourself against the virus and it prevents you from touching your face. Well, I've seen too many people always touching their respirator, readjusting it. So I'm not quite sure that flies. Um, disinfect your face mask often, wash your homemade uh, uh, cloth, your face mask, uh, facial protection as often as you can. Taking your shoes off at the door is just sort of a reminder of, of keeping a healthy, dust-free home, microbial safe home. And again, more and more sanitizer. I think that's ultimately uh, uh, one of my most important messages uh, for today. So I thank you for your time. Let's see, we have, oh, it's 12.44, so uh, I think I'm on time. I am going to uh, stop sharing, and I will give it back to Colleen, who will then moderate our question and answer. Jack, thank you so much. Um, so it's Melanie. I do have quite a few questions coming in for you. Uh, the first one's going to be is, if I'm supporting someone within their home, can you suggest what I should do first? Uh, I think a systematic assessment of everything you do from the minute you walk into the house uh, to the point where you're leaving at the end of the day, sort of writing down everything that's done and systematically saying, okay, I addressed this point, I addressed this point, this. So coming in, immediately taking shoes off, hand sanitizer, creating something of a process flow. Uh, so go through your day and find out what is it that I'm doing? How am I contacting the, um, uh, uh, how's the caregiver contacting the client and, and working with them and proceed to sort of address each one of those. I do think a routine is very important and sometimes you need a list uh, and to systematically, the minute you come in, disinfect the surface counters, disinfect handles, disinfect doorknobs, which is what we do with my mom. We have our uh, caregiver, we gave her a list of to-dos. Every time you come in, X, Y, and Z. I think doing that initial assessment will then help those practices. Wonderful. So since it's so hard to find Clorox and Lysol products, can you add a disinfectant like liquid, such as bleach, to a simple cleaner, um, even any of the more gentle cleaners, to create an effective homemade cleaner and disinfectant? Yes, I'm, I'm going to have to say, please don't do that. Uh, because too many of the cleaners do have ammonia compounds in it, and they may not be on the label. Now, uh, the caveat there is you, you, you're, you can read the label and you could pick out materials because when we mix chlorine with any ammonia compound, we get um, uh, chlor trichloramines and this is a gas that can fill up the house and in some settings is actually cause some fatalities. So I think there's cleaners that clean grit off surfaces and then there's disinfectants that leave a layer of protection and, and disinfectant on there. And you could probably do that in two steps. It, I don't think it's that, um, that hard. Uh, by the way, acids like lemon, citric acid, vinegar, they are uh, reasonably good at killing bacteria, but you notice nowhere on my list of disinfectants that I have acids. So um, vinegar is very strong and, and can, likely kill. Uh, so I know a lot of these home cleaners use vinegar-based solutions. And while I think they're, they're likely to work, uh, given that they're not on the list, I'd say uh, I can't officially bless it. Okay. How effective is UV light disinfection for COVID-19? And do you have any information about light um, intensity and time studies? 
Yes, UV light, uh, specifically UVC, 270 nanometers and uh, below, is very good, very good. We have been using UV lamps in restaurants as a surface disinfectant for decades. Very powerful lights that go on at the end of the day, even in clinical settings, and essentially nuking, irradiating all the surfaces. And by the end of the shift, a few hours later, there's literally no living bacteria virus uh, in that area. The problem with UVC is commercial versus residential. Uh, I've gone to uh, eBay and I saw you could buy UVC lights and people are now buying them, putting them in a box with aluminum foil, putting your respirator in the box, nuking it for an hour to get a nice, you know, uh, a blending of all the rays. Because the problem with UV is it only disaffects what it hits. So you want to make sure it hits the other side of the respirator. But it is very good, and many hospitals have been using it and continue to use it. So um, it's just at the, at the residential level where you make your own uh, device. Uh, you need to be careful because it is a, it's a mutagen. It's a, it, it does um, cause electrophilic compounds that, that can cause cancer. So be careful. Okay. And any suggestions on the best way to clean a cell phone or iPad? Uh, yes. Um, I, hate, I hate to sound cliche, read the instructions, <laughs> read the manufacturer's instructions, but many companies, including Apple and uh, Google, have put advisories on the best way to do this. So if you can't find your device on that site, uh, which sometimes will say, do not use phenol compounds, do not use ammonia, do not use a bleach, use, uh, you know, let's say an alcohol. Um, uh, in general, uh, I think the safest, easiest uh, material is the hand sanitizer, uh, ethanol gel, is very good. You could put it, uh, sit there and clean your, your um, uh, clickers for your TV, which are complicated. It could take you a long time to clean one of these devices because there are so many nooks and crannies as opposed to a cell phone. But I would say when in doubt, start with the gels, the hand sanitizing ethanol gels. Jack, can you talk a little bit about how the transmission of COVID-19 differs from that of the flu? Or again, how, how it's also similar? Yes, well, we, we don't fully understand how many people got sick from inhaling a, uh, a viral particle that started growing and, and reproducing in their throat and worked their way down to the lungs, and how much of it is through uh, hand contact, putting your hands to your eyes, nose, or mouth. So that really is, I think, for an industrial hygienist, the biggest question, because depending what it is, we can institute interventions that are more effective. Um, so we, we don't uh, know. I believe most of it is hand to mouth from fomite transmission. I have no real uh, uh, scientific basis for that, just from what I've been reading. But I think at this point, we have to assume that someone coughing in a cab can easily transmit that exactly to uh, the driver. Which, by the way, in an enclosed setting like that, I think that's a very high risk. Uh, so in, 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 in a cab, if someone is coughing or in a uh, small space. But as far as the air, let's say the air around an urban center in Piscataway or something, um, we still don't know how viable that virus is in causing disease. So the next question is about misting N95 type masks on both sides with an EPA approved disinfectant. Is this an effective method? That's a great question. Thanks for asking it, whoever did that. Um, be very careful with that because um, certain compounds, Lysol, the quaternary ammonias, uh, do not react well with the filtering material. Uh, the filtering material itself is electrostatic. So try to use ethanol uh, and hydrogen peroxide mist if you can get a hold of that, but it's hard to get, uh, as opposed to Lysol. So we, we sort of prefer, meaning CDC also says this, we sort of prefer using the moist heat method or the microwave method and heat to kill it, 
as opposed to just spraying it with some uh, material. Definitely don't spray it with a Clorox because that will uh, cause the material to, uh, to oxidize, including the rubber bands and the metals will, will be affected. Uh, and try to stay away from phenolic compounds with N95s. Jack, uh, previously you mentioned not using a liquid cleaner in a spray bottle. We have someone that wants to know, um, is this true for making a bleach and water solution in a spray bottle to clean services? Yes, and uh, I've read many of Clorox bottles and most of them specifically said do not, uh, uh, do not put it in a spray bottle. So when you make your dilute Clorox solution, uh, this is really meant for a sponge and a rag sort of cleaning. Um, I think if you're buying, if, you're, if you really want to use a spray disinfectant, which is really handy, I like them better anyway, uh, you can control where they go. Uh, you know, go shopping for the right material and maybe even use the label as a guide for percentages of material. Because if you're using it as a spray, it's becoming aerosolized and then you're inhaling it and that may cause other problems. So um, my advice is to try to buy the appropriate, the appropriate, buy the appropriate product for spraying. And there seems to be plenty out there, but you just tell me that many people are having trouble finding that, so they may have to do their own. If you are doing it, please wear an N95 or some good uh, face protection when you're spraying it because the, the chlorine uh, misting uh, is an irritant gas and it will have its own, uh, it will have its own respiratory effects. And is it necessary to use an antibacterial soap to address the coronavirus? Good question. No. You, uh, from everything I've read, the, pro, the, the viral shell is, as usual, a lipid membrane. And you could go ahead and use any soap. It'll catch that and wash it off. So um, there is controversy with antimicrobial soaps uh, and, and uh, bacterial uh, uh, resistance. So I would say no, you don't need to spend the money for a soap that has antimicrobial. Uh, however, if you have it and it's the same, you'll find very often they're the same price. For marketing reasons, they're the same price as the other soaps. Uh, and in that case, I guess I'd go for it if it's the same price, but I wouldn't spend extra for it. Perfect. And is rubbing alcohol appropriate to use to clean counters? Uh, Yes, rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, uh, hopefully it's a strong strength, usually it's 90%, um, is absolutely good. You could pour that on a rag. Uh, I'd rather you not mist it because then it becomes an airborne hazard. But you pour that down, wipe that in the counter, and it will do an excellent job of killing. The problem with isopropyl, if any of you made isopropyl gels with um, because you ran out of the uh, you know, Purell gels, is uh, it doesn't really smell as good. Uh, and it leaves a different odor on your thing. So you may have an odor issue, but as far as effect, uh, efficacy, it's, it's perfect. Wonderful. So if someone's having trouble finding the alcohol and disinfectant cleaners, um, could they use drinking alcohol to actually sanitize a counter? Yes, yeah, so uh, drinking alcohol, ethanol, um, is a uh, grain alcohol is very good. Uh, Seventy percent. The, the uh, FDA requirements there usually are between sixty and ninety percent. Uh, and if you calculate proof, that's one hundred and fifty proof alcohol, which like Bacardi one fifty one. So getting very strong alcohol, and there is a brand that's out there which is pure uh, ethanol, like ninety percent, is what you want to get. Uh, pouring some gray goose on a counter and wiping it down will kill a lot, but it may not kill uh, 90%. It may only kill 90% and leave some there. So, okay. so Jack, I know that we're running close to our um, end time. Do you have an extra five minutes to give today? I do. Yes, it's Friday. It's, 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 it's a nice, quiet day. Perfect. We have a lot of questions still coming in. Yes. Um, so can you discuss your opinion on steam cleaning options for the home? 
Uh, steam cleaning is very useful. So including for what good thing with steam cleaning is, um, it of course is killing the bug, uh, killing the virus and uh, ra relatively safe, very low risk, except for the temperature issue perhaps. So you don't have any harsh chemicals and it's very uh, applicable to a number of materials, including synthetic carpets, couches, and other materials that are around the house. Um, so I would say steam cleaning, um, making sure that that heat is at 140 degrees or so is very good. That would, that would be an effective uh, control measure. And can we talk a little bit about um, equipment that someone may use um, for mobility, such as a wheelchair? Um, is there sanitizing or disinfecting practices that you could best recommend? Yeah, the materials there would be a surface disinfectant, either a spray or a liquid formulation. Uh, and the key is to sort of analyze the usage of that equipment. Let's say if it's a wheelchair or a, uh, or a, 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 a walker, where are, the, where are the people putting their hands and making sure you focus on that point? Doing the bottom of the walker or the wheelchair may not be necessary, but of course the outer rim of the wheels that's it. So I would say that should be a very uh, commonly disinfected uh, item because the transmission there is so, so possible that someone coughing and then grabbing the rails and walking and then doing it again. So I would say multiple times during a shift, I would say that should be done. So obviously we have a lot of parents, teachers, uh, professionals on the line, even students. Um, can you give some recommendations regarding, re, um, as the schools are gonna start to reopen for the disin, uh, disinfecting classrooms and desks, especially when these classrooms um, sometimes have students moving from one class to another throughout the day. Are there any best practices that you could recommend? I think that's going to be a challenging, uh, challenging intervention because uh, it's not a one-shot deal. You know, we're disinfecting the subways uh, last night. Well, the minute they're open again, we have to start from zero. So schools need to develop sustainable routine practices for high-risk areas, whether every single doorknob, every single table, everything that a child is likely to touch every day needs to be systematically cleaned uh, with the right material. Um, because the sense that I'll do this classroom today and that classroom tomorrow, et cetera, is not gonna get us to herd immunity. So we really wanna get all the transmission down such that eventually uh, people uh, immunize uh, uh, such, such that we, we can kill this virus in its tracks. But the key there is repetitive, sustained cleaning of the high-risk areas. Um, and I think that's doable, but it's going to change our labor you know, uh, requirements there. So I know that we've talked a few times about steam cleaning already, um, but for people with uh, sensitivities to different cleaners or dis different disinfectants, um, is steam cleaning as effective of a method? And is there a certain length of time that different services need to be steam cleaned for? Um, I I'm trying to process sort of the different scenarios, whether it's a um, home caregiver or uh, a facility of some sort or a rehabilitation center. So there's all sorts of materials. None of us are really fond of carpet and soft materials in the environmental health world. We always try to go for hard surfaces that can be easily wiped and cleaned and, and mopped, even in homes. One of my biggest advices to people is to get rid of the carpet. It's, it's a reservoir of a lot of uh, perhaps uh, high microbial risk compounds. Anyway, um, I, think the, I think steam, the reason I like it sort of the most is because it's completely chemical free and really goes down to heat and, and time and temperature getting uh, that material at a, it's, it's both sucking up material and in the process disinfecting it as it goes into the container. And, um, and, I, and I like that because it's collecting a variety of material, including allergens and mold spores and all sorts of uh, materials. 
But I, I think, um, and then you have the issue of steam cleaning or high heat treatment of, uh, of bedding materials. Uh, we know the sheets, of course, are gonna go into the laundry, but what about the mattress itself or the mattress cover? How is that gonna be disinfected and what's the, sort of the rate? I think in there, steam cleaning is really your, your best option because any type of chemical application to a surface like that is gonna penetrate and accumulate. So eventually you'll have, a, I think, a, a product that's not very usable. So, uh, uh, if there are specific issues, if, if people want to uh, contact me, uh, I'd be happy to send me some pictures. Say, Jack, what would you do in this situation? I'd be happy, uh, Melanie, to address it more. Great. So, Jack, I want to get to one last question, if we can. And I apologize to everyone whose question uh, we didn't have time for. Um, so the last question that we have... Uh, and I'm trying to group a few questions together to, uh, to really try to get everyone's address, is if someone is caring for someone who has COVID-19, um, should this person um, cover their, their shoes um, when, they go into, when they go into the room and they want to know would they be spreading the virus if they don't? Uh, I think, again, shoes are, are probably low priority, low risk uh, <clears throat> uh, materials. So I wouldn't concern myself too much with that. Uh, respiratory protection, fomite cleaning is probably the highest you'll get. That, it's good. that will be the, the biggest uh, uh, gain there in, in, in managing that. I would say in, in most homes, uh, I've seen people, you know, of course, taking off the shoes at the front door and having some hand wipes there so you can wipe your shoes down. I think that's a nice, good, healthy practice, but it may not uh, really impact the disease risk much at all. So I, I, um, uh, a lot of people are worried about shoes um, and it's, it, we seem to can't, quite convince people that it's the virus doesn't live in soil and is not really on your shoes so but in a year we'll have more epidemiology on this and more science so we'll know more but right now most of what i hear is it's not a high risk material at all so wonderful so on behalf of the community living education project within rutgers school of public health and new york university's college of global public health we thank you for joining us today Following today's webinar, you will receive an email from Colleen McKay Wharton with an evaluation to complete. The evaluation will also include details regarding continuing education credits and a link to our YouTube channel where you can access the recorded version of this session. That link will be shareable. Um, please make sure to check your spam folder if the email is not received following this webinar. Jack, again, thank you so much. We truly appreciate you sharing all your time and expertise with all of us today. Oh, it's great. Uh, thank you, everybody. I just sent a text to everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here, and please feel free to contact me, and I'll do my best to address each of your questions. So be safe. Uh, we'll get through this, and um, take care of yourself. Thank you, everyone. Wishing you a wonderful day, and please be well. Thanks, Jack. Sure. Bye-bye, Melanie. Bye.